Are you ready to be the happiest person that you know? I hope so, and I want to be the guy to take you there. My name is Joe, and I'm a retired firefighter, and I'm the happiest person that I know, despite the fact that several years ago, I literally had a gun to my own head after an on-the-job injury forced me into a medical retirement, followed by the loss of several loved ones, and a dark battle with grief, PTSD, and depression. But... I fought my way out of that, and I prevailed, and I gained unshakable joy and the amazing ability to be totally okay, even when my life circumstances aren't okay at all. And now, nothing brings me greater happiness than sharing with people the tools that led me here, which is exactly what I'm doing at the Grit, Growth, and Gratitude podcast. I'm dropping episodes every week that teach you how to maximize your happiness when times are good and barrel through any obstacle when times are rough. So subscribe now wherever you listen to podcasts because you deserve to have way more Thrive Days than just Survive Days and to have a kick-ass life that you enjoy. I'll see you there. Benvenuti al fantastico show He Said She Heard. Chi è l'ospite di oggi, Mike? Asher Lobb. Oh, welcome to our show. Uh, could you repeat the name, Mike? Asher Lobb. <laughs> Let's welcome our guest today. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of He Said, She Heard. And I'm your host, Mike Fox, and we are enjoying the best of both worlds season. And if you're just tuning in at this part of the season, what does that mean exactly? Well, I started the podcast off as a sketch comedy podcast and over time it's evolved into an interview podcast and the last season was a lot of just interviews a few skits but mostly interviews but some people like both so I figure well I'm going to give the audience I'm going to give you the best of both worlds so this episode is an interview episode and I'm very excited about this particular episode because joining me is a violinist he debuted as a classical violinist with the Buffalo Harmonic. And he's been featured on many different major networks, PBS, CNN, NBC, and even in the New York Post. So joining me today is violinist Asher Lobb. How are you? Pretty good, Mike. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm fantastic. So tell us you know, about how you started. Is it two years old that you started playing violin? Uh, two and change. Okay. Um, definitely was in diapers you when I started. were definitely in diapers when you started. Wow. Yep. That's incredible. The Those were the good old days. days. The, yeah. So that was a great time to start. So, and you're the only one in, in, from your family that has been able to pursue this uh, professionally as your full-time job. Am I correct? Uh, partially correct. Uh, I'm the only one who did pursue it professionally. I would say that my my other three siblings could have easily pursued it professionally, considering that they also started it at yes. a very young age um, and had private lessons. So I just I chose to take the risk because because I'm an idiot. <laughs> but it's paid off though for you, right? <laughs> it has, uh, but uh, you know, in a risky sort of way. So would you say that <laughs> it chose you in a way? Do you feel that that was what happened? It, the violin chose you and you went with it? You know, I don't know if you've heard all my other interviews, but that's pretty much verbatim what uh, my wife uh, told me. So I borrow that line, uh, music chose me. I chose other careers, and then music kept coming back, paying the bills. Uh, so I just kind of opted into that. It was it was making me, it was giving me the most joy in my life. And... Uh, Hit, hit, hit some moments of trauma, um, uh, which were pretty stressful. I've shared with, yes. with the public uh, pretty frequently. But uh, this, this was probably, that was probably the impetus to making a decision, a crazy decision like this to make music a full-time to career. make music a full-time career. That's amazing. <clears throat> so tell us the yeah. story behind your latest single, which, by the way, our listeners can uh, listen to on Spotify. There's a 
link right in the show description below, folks. Yeah, well, it's on all major platforms. I guess Spotify is the preferred go-to for most mm-hmm. most listeners. And um, it's hard for me to even keep track of the latest single because I'm literally releasing something new every month. Uh, but yeah, so that was actually one, one single, single ago. ago. Okay. <laughs> but although it's still very relevant, Mike, uh, because I I actually have uh, the music video to Exodus ready to release. Well, I could do it today. <laughs> it's just yeah. been waiting uh, because I didn't want it to kind of eclipse my my single release, A Tribute to Israel, which is a full symphony production, which I created for the FIDF. I did a whole uh, concert for them out in uh, Atlanta uh, like a week or two ago. So I kind of produced that symphony and uh, the timing just worked out that I wasn't able to finish up the release of the music video for Exodus. Um, but I, but, but the song is out, uh, A Tribute to Israel. So that's the latest release in a nutshell. And Exodus, Exodus will, be, will next. be next. A couple days. Honestly, when I listen to Exodus, I honestly could hear, because I'm, I'm not, I'll be honest with you, like I don't know a lot of other classical violinists by name like you do, but I do hear more than just musical influences in the music. It, for me, personally, it took me to a place in my mind where I was having these mental movies and I was hearing some, like, I would say classic cinema influences. Was that intended? Was that what was going through your mind when you were creating that piece? Yeah, because uh, very much so. And I'm, uh, you got a lot of, I don't know if it's the intuition or just a good, good sense of, like, I don't know, people. Uh, because it's exactly where my head is at. I, I, don't, I try to... I try to meet my listeners where they're at. What's I, I try to I try to bring music that that is accessible and interesting to to all my listeners, which is a challenge. Uh, but the cinema component, like John Williams' influences, there's no question. Uh, you know, um, I, I, sync licensing is is my is the direction for mm-hmm. me professionally uh, at this point. I do live I do like 200 live events uh, per year, but. Uh, I've, I've shifted a lot of that weight into that effort into cinema production, sync licensing, music, um, uh, music libraries, that type of stuff. So music well, for you know, movies. That, that just makes me uh, feel good knowing that when I'm listening to that, uh, when you were creating that, that, yeah, that's what you were thinking and experiencing because uh, other songs have a very cinematic sound. Like I also listened to, when I had it on my Spotify, after that, song finished neon dreams came up which was more contemporary but still cinematic so sort of like a modern uh, cinema nouveau almost so it's just amazing that you and i've heard you say in other interviews bluegrass is a big influence uh, for you as well but it's just it's amazing that you can reach listeners of different demographics all at the same time well, that's really nice of you, Mike. Uh, that's that's what I try to do. Uh, I got a lot of um, a lot of picky listeners out there. They want to hear this, and I want to hear that. Uh, and you know, I like I released a tribute to Israel, and I have a listener who wants a tribute to a different country. I'm not going to mention it because I don't want the the listener who may be watching this uh, <laughs> to get offended. So I'm actually going to work on that. Like they, everybody wants it's something true. different. Uh, but 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 the common denominator here is everybody wants to hear like ever most people that I know enjoy cinematic level music like well-produced stuff uh, uh at least people i'm associated with so that's what i kind of aim for it's what yeah. i like to hear at least. Well, it, honestly in any type of genre um hearing something that's cinematic works on so many levels because even if it's created for just a, a single or a full-length lp whatever genre it may be later on it, it could work for a movie yeah and that's sort mm-hmm. of the intention so uh I hope uh, I hope uh, to to get there, you know, with with some uh, iconic movies uh, with the productions that I'm that right. I'm making right now. So just recently, well, maybe not yeah. very recently, but in the past few years, if I'm not mistaken, you've incorporated yeah. dancing into your um, performances. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, and uh, that's sort of been I'm gonna say like about five six years old um since i started and 
that uh, that's something I, I have a lot of fun doing, uh, specifically with with break dancers, with with other people that that like to do choreography, that have the skill of choreography. I don't like to do it as much mm -hmm. on my own. Um, I, it's just it just doesn't work out as well because there's a lot going on with the violin. But if I have additional dancers that are kind of complementing my movements, it's uh, it's a lot. Right. Cooler. Well, it's like I think about that because um, when I watch, uh, let's say something like America's Got Talent, and then the judges sometimes. Uh, when they critique the performance, sometimes they might say the special effects are overshadowing the artist, but other times it kind of, I guess, accentuates uh, the music, accentuates the emotion when you do see dancers in there because they're all working together and they're all sending the same universal message to the audience when you're watching a performance like that. Yeah, I agree. I, I see it as a compliment and it's kind of, part and parcel to the to the performance of, of the the lead so in this case uh, myself on on violin yeah uh, i'm actually i i'm hesitant to mention this uh, as an announcement but there's been a commercial that's been sort of in the running uh myself basically me dancing and playing mm -hmm. violin it's a in a major commercial uh we shot it like a, two years ago <laughs> they've been working on this like minute and a half commercial for like two years now um it, it's gonna be on any wow. day now any week now so but i'll let you know asap but uh that's got to be exciting i, I guess I, yeah well uh, it's exciting and it's it's just kind of funny how long it's been taking yes but uh part of it's my fault well, it's like sometimes when yeah. you know there's a long endeavor sometimes it's, it's like a pregnant pause it's like you're like i'm ready to do this but there's other things happening in my life right now and it's what's that's the whole thing with creativity is just it's all about the right time and so many things happen in our lives that might you know get in the way of us releasing it and we might think my god i should have done it but then it's like <laughs> it's almost like an intuition like you know this is the right time to release it to drop it yeah, well, it's actually not, it's it's a third party team that's kind of using me as the featured artist, but uh, it, it's part partially. I guess my, the decisions that I've made in terms of public performance has has impacted the delay of I the see. release. So, in a nutshell, I haven't really been doing the choreography as much, so it's not kind of as hot. Um, I've been focusing more on the symphonies and on and on like the sync production. I see. So there's been somewhat of a delay there. I'm trying to tackle both. Uh, anyway, I just mentioned that just because it was in the context of the choreography that right. you, you well, brought that, up. You see, that's a lot. That, that, those are a lot of things because it, it does sound like you do wear many hats. You know, you're more than just the independent artist that you are uh, self-supporting. You're also an entrepreneur as well. So doing all those things just can't be easy especially juggling that with family life whatnot and you know having a touring schedule that works for you and helps you maintain that balance so there's so much going on for you yeah there's the thank god there's a lot going on for me and i know that this is the case with you and everybody else in the world like everybody's yeah. busy but even as a music yeah even as a musician like sometimes people think oh yeah you just show up to a gig like people have actually asked that asked me that and mentioned oh yeah you just like don't you just do the performance I'm like no there's a lot of behind behind the scenes a lot there of background is. work that's involved in even getting to that stage it is there's so many yeah. mechanics that, that go behind that before you finally get to that performance but from the audience's perspective sometimes they look at it and, and it looks easy <laughs> for them almost but you you know yourself this took a lot of work to get to that point where you're ready to just start and be ready whenever the the curtain goes open right yeah and uh you know it's also the there's a challenge in overthinking things and over preparing you can screw up if you over prepare you have to like kind of under prepare mm -hmm. a little bit and so you're kind of still on your toes it's, it's it a tricky, tricky business you want to make it seem extemporaneous to not seem so uh like uh too polished in a way you know so that way but the, th yeah. the, the thing is uh, is what you're doing is you're creating something that people can relate to and you're able to have such a, a, a broad audience and that's just it's amazing because the violin's a classical instrument but you are using it in a way to relate to modern audiences which is just an amazing gift that i'm sure brings you joy because you know you're doing it uh, from your heart you know and i did hear you say in one previous interview it's just like you want to make people happy and that makes you happy 
Yeah, that that's one of the reasons you had, you did your homework, Mike. I wasn't even expecting you to like know me that well. Uh, maybe you didn't do your homework; you just know me. Uh, but but again, that, that that's why I so I'm I'm impressed. But I, I this is why I chose this career. It's uh, you know life's short, and uh, before you know before you know it, you're old and gray, and it's like I I crave the human connection. I feel like I I can't stand. Uh, I don't know the corporate type environment. I work in a corporate type environment. I, w I work with corporations, but I mean like the the corporate type of situation where where everything's like where you don't connect with people in a genuine way for the sake of connecting with them. You connect with them for the sake of like climbing the ranks or there's always a strategy yeah. involved. And and I just I, I crave like the, a meaningful connection with people. Uh, you know, just in a way that makes them happy, makes me happy, makes people want to smile, enjoy life. Like that's, that's what is deeply important to me. Um, you know, obviously paying the bills important yes. too, but uh, it's just, uh, I think I, and I think that everybody generally feels that way, but I guess um, it mattered enough to me to take a risk. Yes. And as I said before, earlier in this episode, that risk is definitely paid off. Are you ready to be the happiest person that you know? I hope so, and I want to be the guy to take you there. My name is Joe, and I'm a retired firefighter, and I'm the happiest person that I know, despite the fact that several years ago, I literally had a gun to my own head after an on-the-job injury forced me into a medical retirement, followed by the loss of several loved ones, and a dark battle with grief, PTSD, and depression. But I fought my way out of that and I prevailed and I gained unshakable joy and the amazing ability to be totally okay even when my life circumstances aren't okay at all. And now nothing brings me greater happiness than sharing with people the tools that led me here, which is exactly what I'm doing at the Grit, Growth and Gratitude podcast. I'm dropping episodes every week that teach you how to maximize your happiness when times are good and barrel through any obstacle when times are rough. So subscribe now wherever you listen to podcasts because you deserve to have way more Thrive Days than just Survive Days and to have a kick-ass life that you enjoy. I'll see you there. Lighten it up a little bit. Do you have any uh, funny stories that you want to share? Uh, well, I'm not a very funny guy, although I try to be. Um, I make an ass of myself on Instagram daily, uh, <laughs> and, and I kind of like the, like the, the the shocked responses of some of my some of my uh, my viewers. But uh, um, I, I have a bunch of funny stories, none of which I can actually relate properly right now. But I can tell you something interesting that happened that was probably going to be the mo one of the most personally iconic uh, mm -hmm. moments, momentous occasions, whatever, was uh, playing for the, the king of, of Morocco in, like a, in a restaurant in Manhattan uh, where it wasn't really expected. Wow. 
And he was he wasn't dressed like a king, I, I guess, because that probably explains why the oh, FBI boy. was there uh, at the entrance. But uh, uh, and I just gave away the punchline. Actually, what happened? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go go to the funny okay. part of the story where I, I pulled up in front of this restaurant. I I don't think I should mention it uh, just That's for funny. security reasons because he may go there mm. multiple times when he's it's in the walls. Whatever it's Southern Manhattan gotcha. right, region, but. A district so uh, I get out of my car like I typically do sometimes I do private events there and I uh, I'm unloading my equipment uh, I had to move the, the cones which were on the way and then there's like it's like a black vehicle right in front of me I'm and uh, you know I'm doing it like a boss like guys get on my way I gotta bring my stuff into the <laughs> into the restaurant this big burly guy comes up to me in sunglasses he's like oh, you're really yeah. nicely uh, he's like excuse me sir you know uh, I'm gonna have to ask you to put those snow those those, those cones back um, and could you please tell me what you're doing here? I was like, uh, sir, I, you know, I'm working with the restaurant here. Are you the owner? Um, he's like, no, I'm, I'm with the FBI. I uh, takes out his badge. I'm like, and like, uh, I'm usually, uh, I usually don't like shake, but I don't know. Just the way that he went about it. I was like thinking, is he going to arrest me or, or give me a ticket? And, uh, or is my client, uh, somebody bigger than I actually had anticipated? Cause sometimes I have some pretty big clients and, uh, <laughs> so, but, uh, <laughs> so I'm like, oh, okay, uh, no problem, sir. I'm, I'm just gonna, but I, I kind of argue with him like in a, in a yeah. respectful manner. I said like, this is wall street. I, I just gave it away. <laughs> I, didn't uh, go I, wall I can't really like park a mile down the road. <laughs> it shouldn't be surprising that it's wall street, <laughs> yeah. you know, where else are they? The guy's right. gonna be hanging out. So I'm like, you know, I can't load my equipment. Like, I don't have my roadie today. I can't load my, my equipment like a mile down the road. Like, if you're ever on yes. Wall Street, it's insane. So I, I I said, can I just just put my stuff in there for? He's like, I, I'm I'm gonna have to ask you to step in the car. <laughs> so I actually had to like roll my stuff there, which was pretty un unbelievable. But I wasn't gonna argue with an FBI agent. Wow. Um. So yeah, then I found out that I was playing for the 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 king of of morocco and uh, the only thing i regret about that experience was uh not having any moroccan music to play <laughs> so that kind of sucked because <laughs> afterwards they're like so they clapped they're like yeah great but 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 a, a bunch of the guests on the side they're like you didn't have any moroccan music I'm like nobody told me he was going to be here <laughs> but he asked me to come over and play so did he enjoy it though did the king yeah, of was... morocco enjoy the music he did, and he said thank you. He was a really okay. sweet, sweet man. Um, I and, and a bunch of his, yeah. I know his entourage. It was a big, big entourage. Um, probably about four or five people. Like they asked me for my card. Uh, I haven't gotten a call from them since. I'm waiting to get a call to to visit the the palace. Uh, hasn't happened yet. But that's my story for the year. I don't think anything quite measures up to that that uh, level of experience oh at this point oh my god i am sure you were just frightened when the uh, guy said i'm with the fbi you know you're like <laughs> well here's the second part of like of the story that I actually didn't mention it's kind of wild um i i took a video i wanted people to i took a video of me with with the the king uh, but but not with his like I didn't want him to, he was he was kind of speaking with a couple people to the side and I was playing some music and then I sort of whatever took a break um, and I just wanted to show that like where I was and share yeah. it on social media and then the owner mm. of the restaurant who like he knows me and I've been there before he's like you you gotta you gotta delete yeah. that now like I was like okay I'll delete it no like in front of me right now <sighs> like you can't you can't be serious so I deleted it. And apparently he didn't want me to delete it, but he said it because he was in earshot of the king and he didn't want to get in trouble or have him not come back again for, for privacy reasons. So uh, after I deleted it, he said he came back to me 10, 10 minutes later. He's like, you can I can I can help you like get that video back. Gives me a wink. I'm like, you sure? Because I, I don't see it in my trash anymore. Um, and and he's so he tries to show me. He's like, you have an Apple iPhone. I'm like, no. So I have an Android. Apparently, with the Apple, it saves. Um, so I'm just like, uh, I, I'm, I'm really frustrated. But uh, that, that, I, I don't think that's a funny part of the story. But it's just like a weird kind of anecdote. Wow. That um. That's wild. You know, wow. That. <laughs> so if you're out there, uh, it was King King Mohammed the King fifth, Mohammed the sixth, the sixth, okay. the sixth. The sixth. Um, if you're out there and you're watching this, I look forward to meeting you again, <laughs> sir.
and I'll prepare a Moroccan song. Yeah. I'm done. I, I I'm hope done with that story. That's a sequel to the story. <laughs> with with less like I hope so. <laughs> moments cuz it yeah, seemed like was, there were a few of those yeah. unexpected moments there. A couple oh, flat yes, notes. The FBI and then the owner of the restaurant, yeah, the combination. Um before we yep. go, I, I just want to figure out what are some of uh, we talked about influences earlier when I was talking about cinematic influences, but what what would be some of your musical influences that you uh, feel that really helped kind of uh, shape you as an artist? Oh well, you know, uh, legends like John Luke Ponty, but legends in fusion mm -hmm. jazz, violin um, of uh, Vanessa May, David Garrett. Uh, you know, and all the pop artists out there, they're definitely an influence in, in my music, just the yes. cinematic type stuff. Like I mentioned, um, uh, Joe Venuti. I mean, I, I'm just mentioning a bunch like a uh, Chick Corea. There's, there's the, uh, the fusion, uh, kind of fiddle mm -hmm. vibe, the blue, bluegrass type of vibe. Um, yeah, I, I could go down a very long list and that the, the influences are, are far beyond that, but those are some of the most iconic influences. Wow. For me. The violinist. Yeah, I just wanted to mention specifically those people because they they sort of went beyond what's sort of expected of a violinist. You know, they went into improv land, improvisation, uh, creating music, which essentially for your listeners, just so mm -hmm. they understand what I mean, uh, creating music like on the fly almost, uh, playing along to the chord progressions. And, and that's that's a, probably been one of the biggest most important impacts on uh, like instrumental impacts that that have uh, on my career. That's the, pretty much the reason why I do this full time. If I if I didn't improvise, I wouldn't be doing violin. Yeah, because I feel that improvisation it just it uh, makes it seem natural, more organic. Because if stuff is too planned, too polished, the the connection isn't the same. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, at least that's how I feel. Uh, you know, some some things are you know. There's a reason why I, I you know, why people release music on Spotify. They want it to be polished. But in a live performance, often people like the new the newness of a performance, uh, as opposed to something that's like regurgitated from a, a previous yeah. recording. Yeah, because it's, it's it's fresh, it's exciting, and there's a lot of anticipation. Yeah, you know, rather than just you know belting out the classics, maybe you know giving something new. Uh, is, have you ever done that during a gig? Have you ever played something that was unreleased before? Uh, I've done it on social uh -huh. media, which is probably not not the best idea. I can't do that with with okay. syncable music, music that's going to be on TV uh, f for licensable gotcha. reasons. Um, but I do uh, I do release just because you mentioned that uh, music on my on Astrolab dot com that I do not release to Spotify. So there's the Lord of the Rings uh, mm -hmm. medley. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the Rings of Fire, uh, Rings of Rings, <laughs> Rings of, Power. of Power, the Amazon series. I'm in, I'm in love with that. So that that's not on on major any major platform. That is uh, specifically only on AstroLab.com uh, and a bunch of other symphonies mm -hmm. too. Uh, it's a couple, few covers. That's a great that's, way to uh, do it. Yeah, but 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 I I, I I perform all sorts of songs uh, live and and I post on social media that I don't that I don't release uh, as curated, uh, mixed and mastered, uh, made on Spotify, iTunes, that type of stuff. Before we go, Ash, is there anything you want to tell the uh, viewers slash listeners for the audio or video version of the same episode um, about where they can find you? And I mean, I'll have it in my show description below. But is there anything that you just want them to know? Before we go i want you guys to know how much i love you and appreciate you that you know stop by don't be shy say hello drop you know, a line check me out on uh instagram yeah facebook tiktok asher lob a-s-h-e-r-l-a-u-b and uh asherlob.com is probably the easiest way to find me and uh you know uh i i just want to mention one thing just as yeah. far as my career uh goes those of you who are who might be interested in in making music career i uh, uh I, i'm grateful that that i'm able to to pay the bills. And I think it's important to, before you even consider a career that's a little bit risky, at least know that you can sort of pay the bills and then you kind of take the next step uh, in whatever it is that you're passionate about. Um, Cause I, you know, that the, the famous joke goes, uh, what do you call a musician with, without a girlfriend? <laughs> Homeless. <laughs> so 
you know, just a little uh, comedy there. But just just make sure that you uh, you're able to you have some degree of success before you take a risk and, and venture out into no man's land. So I just want to sort of share that important piece with listeners. Wow. Well, couldn't be better said than that. My guest today has been Osher Lob, and we're going to uh, conclude with a song here. Until next time, folks. Thanks, Osher. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mike.